In this video, we're going to go over the resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential is the membrane potential of a neuron at rest. So when the neuron is not firing any action potentials, and also when it's not receiving any kind of inputs from presynaptic neurons. Now, one thing you should know is that this use of the word potential here is not correct from a physics standpoint. Electric potential is referring to the potential at one particular point. Anytime we're talking about the resting membrane potential or membrane potential, we're not looking at the electric potential at one point. We are comparing the electric potential inside the cell versus outside the cell. So for example, when we say that the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts, what we mean is that the electric potential inside the cell is 70 millivolts lower than outside the cell. And since we're comparing the electric potential at two different points, the correct physics term here to use is voltage, not electric potential. So this should technically be called resting membrane voltage. However, you're gonna find that the majority of biology textbooks out there use resting membrane potential. So that's what we'll go with, but you should know from a physics standpoint that it should really be voltage. Okay. So now to discuss how we get the resting membrane potential, let's talk about the sodium potassium pump or the Na plus K plus ATPase. As you can see from this diagram, the sodium potassium pump is a protein that uses ATP to pump three sodium cations out of the cell and two potassium cations into the cell as a form of active transport. The result of the activity of the sodium potassium pump is that it creates an electrochemical gradient. This means that there is both an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient. The electrical gradient is the result of the fact that three cations are pumped out of the cell and two cations are pumped into the cell. This results in the net loss of positive charge from inside the cell. And often, people use this to explain why the resting membrane potential is negative. But as we're gonna see in this video, that's not the case. And hopefully by the time you're finished with this video, you'll understand why the resting membrane potential is really negative. The second is the chemical gradient. So the chemical gradients is essentially looking at concentration gradients. So the result of the activity of the sodium potassium pump is that sodium has a high concentration outside the cell and a low concentration inside the cell. For potassium, it's the opposite. It has a high concentration inside the cell and a low concentration outside the cell. Okay, so next, let's look at the result of this on the intracellular and extracellular ion concentrations. We have ion I for intracellular ion concentration and ion O for the outside or extracellular ion concentration. For sodium and potassium pump, this is fairly straightforward because we know what the gradients are gonna be based on the sodium potassium pump. So sodium is high outside the cell and low inside the cell. Potassium is the opposite. Potassium has a high concentration inside the cell and a low concentration outside the cell. For chloride and calcium, you also need to know these concentration gradients, but unlike sodium and potassium, you aren't responsible for knowing the proteins and transporters responsible for generating these gradients. So for chloride, it has a low concentration inside the cell and a high concentration outside the cell. Calcium is very similar. It also has a lower concentration inside the cell than outside the cell. The difference with calcium though from the other ions is that its concentration gradient is very large because the concentration of calcium inside the cell is very, very low. So this leads to a very large chemical gradient for calcium across the cell. Okay, so what are these concentrations helpful for? Well, if we know the ion concentrations inside the cell and outside the cell, we're able to calculate what is called the equilibrium potential using the Nernst equation. So here we have the Nernst equation, which is E ion is equal to RT over ZF times the natural log of the extracellular ion concentration divided by the intracellular ion concentration. 
E ion is the equilibrium potential for an ion, and it's defined as the membrane potential at which there is no net movement of that ion. This takes into account both the electrical gradient and chemical gradient of that particular ion. R and F, these are constants you'll recall from general chemistry. So R is the gas constant, F is Faraday's constant. Z is the ion valence. This is the charge of the ion of interest. So for sodium, it's plus one. For chloride, it's minus one. For calcium, it's plus two. T is the temperature. So what do we get from these calculations? Well, again, we're gonna get the equilibrium potential. So what is so important about the equilibrium potential? Well, again, it's gonna be helpful for determining what the potential of a cell is gonna be at any point. And for the MCAT, you generally will not be asked to do calculations with natural log because you don't have a calculator. So don't worry too much about having to do calculations with this equation, but you should be able to understand in general how this equation works. And we can take a look with these ions right here. So if we start with sodium, we know that sodium has a high concentration outside the cell and a low concentration inside the cell. This means that based on its chemical gradient, the sodium cation wants to move into the cell, right? That's based on the chemical gradient. The equilibrium potential is the potential at which there is no net movement of that ion. So we have to think about what do we need the potential of the cell to be to essentially cancel out this movement from the chemical gradient. And again, based off the chemical gradient, sodium wants to move into the cell. So you have to ask yourself, if I want to prevent sodium from entering the cell, do I want the cell to be positive or do I want the cell to be negative? And of course, if the cell is negative, then that will want to pull sodium cations into the cell because sodium is positive. So that's not what we want. However, if the cell is positive, then that will repel sodium cations because sodium as a cation doesn't want to move towards a positive. So in this case, sodium has an equilibrium potential that is a positive value. And when you plug in the numbers and do the calculation, you'll find that the equilibrium potential of sodium is approximately positive 60 millivolts. And again, this makes sense based on the concentration gradient for sodium. Let's now consider potassium. Potassium has a high concentration inside the cell and a low concentration outside the cell. This means that naturally, potassium wants to leave the cell. So if we want to find the equilibrium potential, we have to think at what potential of the cell will there be no net movement of potassium? So since potassium wants to leave the cell based on its concentration gradient, we have to think about what potential the cell needs to be to prevent potassium from leaving the cell. And if you think about it, if the cell is negative, that would mean potassium cations being positive would be leaving a negative, which they don't want to do. So if you have a negative potential, you can prevent potassium from leaving the cell. So the equilibrium potential of potassium, when you plug in the different values, is actually about negative 90 millivolts. Okay, so now how about chloride? Chloride has a high concentration outside the cell and a low concentration inside the cell. That means chloride wants to move into the cell. If we want to prevent chloride, which is negatively charged from moving into the cell, then we want to make the cell negative to repel chloride from wanting to enter the cell. So chloride has a resting membrane potential that is negative, and it has a value of approximately negative 70 millivolts. Finally, we have calcium. Calcium has a high concentration outside the cell, so that means calcium wants to enter the cell. To prevent positive charges like calcium from entering the cell, we want the cell to be positive as well. So calcium also has a positive 
equilibrium potential. And since the concentration gradient is particularly large, it's actually a very large positive potential for calcium. Okay, so what this essentially means is if the membrane potential is at positive 60 millivolts, then there's no net movement of sodium into the cell or out of the cell. Similarly, if we're at a membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts, there's no net movement of chloride into the cell or out of the cell. So again, how does this help us? Well, if the membrane potential is not at the equilibrium potential for that ion, then the ion will be moving in such a direction as to pull the potential towards its equilibrium potential, right? If the membrane potential is zero millivolts, then sodium is going to want to move into the cell to make the cell positive until the potential is positive 60 millivolts. So what you want to understand here then is the membrane potential gets pulled to the equilibrium potentials of the ions. But since all these ions have different equilibrium potentials, how does it work? Well, as it turns out, at any point in time, the different ions will have different permeabilities. And the ion that is the most permeable is going to best be able to pull the, the membrane potential to its equilibrium potential. So that means the membrane potential is closest to the equilibrium potential of the most permeable ion. So if we want to figure out what the resting membrane potential is, we need to know at rest which ion is the most permeable. And at rest, that is potassium. And that's because in cells, there is what is called leaky potassium channels. So these leaky potassium channels are called leaky because they're essentially always slightly open. So potassium is just leaking out of the cell. And since potassium is the most permeable ion at rest, that means the cell is going to try to pull its potential towards the equilibrium potential of potassium. So we end up with a value that is close to the equilibrium potential of potassium of negative 70 millivolts. It's not exactly the equilibrium potential of potassium, and that's because the ions have some permeability as well, but it's close to potassium because potassium is the most permeable ion. So what happens, for instance, during an action potential? Well, if you have an action potential, if the threshold is reached, then voltage-gated sodium channels are going to open. When voltage-gated sodium channels open, then sodium becomes the most permeable ion. And that's going to pull the membrane potential towards the equilibrium potential of sodium. So that's why we can see during depolarization, the membrane potential goes towards the equilibrium potential of sodium. So as a summary, what you can understand is that the membrane potential of a cell is determined by the equilibrium potential of the most permeable ion, and at rest, that is potassium from the leaky potassium channels.